From the beginning of time, the North American continent was a land of vast spaces, of vast abundance. Yet for countless centuries, it waited for a people to call it their own. During the year 1000 AD, the first white immigrant set foot upon its shores. Its only inhabitants were Indians, and it is believed that their ancestors had emigrated from Asia. On a return voyage from Norway to his native Greenland, the Viking ship of Leif Erikson was blown off its course, and he discovered the coast of what is now known as the United States of America. We have no knowledge of how long Erikson remained here or how far he penetrated into the interior. But this we do know. He called his discovery Vinland, and finally he sailed away. In time, other immigrants came, the pilgrims. For here was a refuge for those who sought to escape oppression. Here a man could worship God according to his conscience, could speak his mind without fear of reprisal. For these things, men and women risked the dangers of the open seas and faced the terrors of the wilderness. There were others who had the courage to suffer and sacrifice, and we Americans are sons and daughters of these immigrants of early days. After the first generation, they became Native Americans, and because of them, we are a nation that combines the best of all nations. George Washington was a descendant of an English family. A number of his officers were born in Europe and had fought for other countries. General Lafayette came from France, Generals Kosciuszko and Pulaski from Poland. Others followed in their footsteps, pioneers from across the seas, inspired by a dream that drove them on. It was their blood, their sweat, their tears that made possible the world's great dream of freedom, the greatest dream that ever came true. They knew that here was the only country where any man was as good as the next one if he believed he was. They broke the ties that bound them and traveled half across the world so that out of the dust of Europe's empires, they could help to build our union. In the New York of 1853, there was an old building near the docks which was known as Castle Garden. Here, the immigrant had his first contact with the people of his adopted land. And here, one day, came Feodor and Maria Kanowski from the Polish Ukraine. Well, perhaps their name wasn't Kanowski, and they might have come from Sweden. Or perhaps they came from Austria, or from the land of Hungary, or it might have been from Ireland, or a dozen different countries. But for the purposes of this story, we'll call them Feodor and Maria Kanowski. They wanted to look their best as they landed in America, so they wore the colorful costumes in which they'd been married. In their hearts, they were already Americans. Feodor and Maria had a job waiting for them on the farm of a relative in Ohio. They intended to be good citizens, never to become a burden to the community, so they saved their money and walked the many miles to their destination. Hardships meant nothing to them, for they were very young, and at last, they were free. When they reached the town in Ohio where Feodor's relatives were waiting to meet them, they heard bands playing, saw citizens waving flags, and they said, how wonderful are these Americans who hold a festival to celebrate the day of our arrival. <laughs> how could Feodor and Maria know that this was the 4th of July? Feodor could speak no English then, and he knew but one way to show his happiness, a folk dance of the Polish Ukraine. Within eight years, they had their own small farm and three little Americans to help them. George Washington Konowski, Martha Washington Konowski, and Thomas Jefferson Konowski. But they were naturalized citizens, and President Lincoln had called for volunteers. Feodor believed it was his job to help preserve the Union. So, like thousands of other new citizens from the old world, he enlisted to fight under the flag that he had made his own. It was Walt Whitman, the American poet, descended from English and Holland Dutch immigrants, who wrote those deathless lines. Liberty, I think all war through time, was really fought and ever will be really fought for thee. Other than a great faith in the desire to be good citizens, 
Millions like the Kanowskis came here empty-handed. But through the years, they've never ceased making payments on their debt of gratitude. Theodore had often said, I'd give anything I have to America. I'd give my good right arm. He kept that promise. Theodore and Maria had to start all over again. And they gave half a lifetime of hard labor to the land they loved so well. Meanwhile, their sons and daughters became men and women and had sons and daughters of their own. They worked with their heads and their hands and always with their hearts as they helped to build America. Feodor kept telling them that to be a good American, one had to have an education. So they worked hard to get it. He told them that being poor didn't matter, but being free meant everything. So the name of Kanowski continued to spread throughout the country until it commanded the same respect as the more common English names of Smith and Jones. It was in May of 1898 when Feodor summoned his sons and daughters, his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren, and they came from the north, the south, the east, and the west. After 34 years of peace, the United States had threatened to intervene in Cuba, and Spain had declared war. This is our country, Feodor said, and we have earned the right to fight for her, as I fought in 1861. Six of his grandsons, Bill, Peter, Joe, Ted, Paul, and Jim, told their grandfather that they were about to enlist. These were young Americans, native Americans, and Feodor's heart swelled with pride. Of the six who went away, only two came home. One dead on the field and three the victims of the malaria that took so many of our men. Again, the Kanowskis had made with their own blood a payment on their debt of gratitude. Then came the turn of the century, and the descendants of Feodor and Maria kept pace with America as she marched onward toward her destiny. One of them bought an interest in a large ranch where he had started as a cow hen. In time, he bought the ranch itself, married a red-headed girl named O'Brien, raised a raft of kids, and ran for sheriff of the county. Another devoted his life to the study of a dangerous disease and found a cure for it. They were just average men, these Kanowskis. But on the American scene, the average man is a very important individual. There was a Judge Kanowski serving his community and a surgeon who straightened the limbs of stricken children. There was a priest and a printer who became an editor. And just to make things even, there was one who never amounted to anything at all. But his dog loved him till the day he died. So he couldn't have been all bad. In 1917, after Germany had added insult to injury, Congress declared war, and President Wilson signed a bill to draft the young manhood of the nation. But the Kanowskis loved their country too well to wait for the draft. When it was known that war was inevitable, they were again called to a meeting at the old homestead. By now, they had increased to such an extent that there were many who couldn't even get into the house. Maria was gone, but the old lion of the family, worn out by a lifetime of hard labor, lingered on. He knew this was the last time he would ever see his descendants, so he ordered his oldest son to carry on in his place. Their country was again in danger, but he sensed that this was only the beginning, that that same danger would strike again in a more terrible form. We must fight with everything we have, he told them. Like all Americans, you are the sons and daughters of immigrants. You are the new blood that keeps fresh the life stream of our country. You are the hope of today and tomorrow, and all the tomorrows to come. They did fight with everything they had, and when our armies came home, many of their sons were left to sleep beneath the fields of France. Remember, this story of the Kanowskis could have been taken from the records of a hundred other families that had their humble beginning with the arrival of two immigrants from the old world. Instead of the Polish Ukraine, they might have come from a dozen different countries, and their names are legion. That man who sleeps in the tomb of the unknown soldier, his name may be Kelly, it may be Jones, it could even be Kanowski. A biography of famous Americans lists the names of many who were not even born here. John Erickson, who designed the Monitor and helped to turn the tide of battle for the Union Navy, was born in Sweden. 
the Carnegie libraries, storehouses of education, known from one end of America to the other, were given to the land of his adoption by Andrew Carnegie, who came from Scotland. George Washington Gothels, who built the Panama Canal, was born in Holland. Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the telephone, he came from Scotland too. The American who invented and built the first submarine, John Philip Holland, was born in Ireland. Newt Rockney, beloved coach of Notre Dame's football team, a man whose name will live forever in the annals of American sports, Norway. Samuel Gumpers, one of the first great leaders of American labor, came from England. Joseph Pulitzer, the great journalist, was born in Hungary. Charles Steinmetz, famous electrical engineer, born in Germany. Arturo Toscanini, musical genius, comes from Italy. Edward Bach, the famous publisher from the Netherlands. Madame schumann heinck the great operatic star from Germany. On Sunday, December 7th, 1941, George Washington Kanowski, now the eldest of them all, heard the fateful news from Pearl Harbor. He knew there was no time to call a meeting. His people were scattered all over the country and every moment counted. But he carried out his father's wishes and sent a message to every family. Let every family of our name give all they have to this effort. You are the hope of today and tomorrow and all the tomorrows to come. It found most of them already working for their country. The teachings of Theodore had been handed down from generation to generation, and one of his sayings had been taken from the words of Lincoln, let us have faith that right makes might. And in that faith, let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it. Then on May 21st, 1944, I Am an American Day was celebrated in all our great cities from coast to coast. There were marching warriors, statesmen orators, and blood-tingling spectacles. It was the spirit of a nation at war, the spirit of victory. But the spirit of millions of little people stole the show. For it is the little people who fight all wars. The Kanowskis were present at one of the celebrations. They were there with their daughters in uniform, with a group of their sons who had come back for a little time from the fighting overseas. In every city, rain or shine, the stadiums and coliseums were like giant salad bowls, filled to overflowing, stirred within them as if by an unseen ladle was a bit of everything that makes up a nation and a way of life called America. Other daughters of the Kanowskis proudly marched in line, wax and waves and spars and marines. For you must not forget that the name Kanowski is only a symbol for a hundred other names. And this story is taken from the history of many other families that began as immigrants. Indeed, we all began that way. From the landing of Leif Erikson to Ellis Island, the story of the immigrants is written in the vast expanse of our country, in the factories and the homes, in their sweat and tears, in their hopes and prayers. Great stars from the screen and from radio were on hand in every city to help celebrate that glorious day. Dennis Morgan summed it up when he said, Every American knows what the men of our army and navy are doing overseas. Every kid from six to 60 knows that story by heart. Only a small part of those men are professional soldiers. The great majority are from factories, schools, farms, and stores. Civilians who have taken time out to fight a war. Who are they? Americans, yes. Free men. But they're not all named Smith, Brown, and Jones. Read the casualty lists. The names of those who are out there giving their all. The O'Briens are there, Cohens, Kellys. But Aschenbachs, Arsanis, Pepinos, Heismans, Dardanyaks, Prisniks. Moradians, Bjorkens. Yes, you can hardly pronounce their names. They are there too. Americans, you bet. You know how they can fight. And nobody out there asks whether their parents have been here two years or 200 years. They're fighting for their country, our country, and your problem. And they'll come back with the same unpronounceable names. And every one of them will look you straight in the eye and say, 
Mister, I am an American. 